How's it going everyone? Data here and welcome back to the Vancouver Canucks franchise mode here on NHL 24, episode number 8 headed into the 2025 draft and off season. In the last one, it was possibly one of my favorite postseason episodes of all time. What a ridiculous ride. It was a duel of the fates. I hope that you enjoyed it thoroughly. In round number 1, we faced the Vegas Golden Knights. Vegas being the second best team in the NHL and ourselves being the sixth best team in the NHL. We quickly went down three games to none, but then pulled off the reverse sweep, moving from Thatcher Demko to Casey DeSmith for the second consecutive postseason. Casey DeSmith carried us as we reverse swept Vegas, including a game seven shutout victory on the road. Then in round number two, we faced the Blackhawks who eliminated us last season in five games in round number one. We beat them in a six game series, which was very exciting. And then in the conference final against the Winnipeg Jets, we were up two games to one, but then lost three consecutive as Connor Hellebuck put on a clinic to eliminate us in six games and then go on to lose themselves to the New Jersey Devils who won back-to-back -back Stanley Cups. So the stats were fine. The, the contributions from our team were acceptable for the most part. Just to note about uh, Connor Hellebuck, if you're interested, even though he had the series against um, New Jersey after us, he still ended the postseason with a 932 save percentage and 2.39 goals against average. I believe that was even at 940 when we first started the series against Winnipeg. So Hellebuck was just a man possessed. And even though DeSmith was doing his job, you know, only allowing one, two, sometimes three max goals per game, we just couldn't break through Hellebuck enough to get the job done. Speaking of DeSmith, he went 9-6-1 and one with two shutouts, a 924 save percentage and 2.39 goals against average. Classic EA voodoo, you swap to your lower overall goalie and then you'll be fine. Demko was 0-3 in the first round. We accidentally played him in game one of round two where he got a victory allowing like, what, four goals on 20-some shots? So we said goodbye after that for good in the postseason, at least for this last postseason. 1-3-0 with an 875 save percentage. It's crazy. It is so crazy. 87 overall, back-to-back -back years where compared to the league, he would, I would think, be in the top five for Vezina votes. Then in the postseason the last couple of years, a combined, like, what, close to four or 3.8 something goals against average, like an 870, eight, high 860s save percentage crazy. And meanwhile, you have Casey DeSmith, who for the second straight postseason took over the crease, and now his career numbers, if you add in one appearance with Pittsburgh in 2022, he has a 929 save percentage through 19 postseason games. So, just crazy to note that, but back to the point totals. Our stars were our stars. Patterson 18 points, Kuzmenko 14, Dano pulled his weight with 12 points, Pud Colson scored a hat-trick somewhere in there as well. He had 11 points in the end. JT Miller only had one one goal and had 25 penalty minutes, which did not help us. Besser, 9. Hronik, 8. It started to drop off a little bit. Sam Reinhardt, a top 6 player, only 7 points. Thankfully, the depth helped out. You have 7 points from 4th liner Pat Maroon, 6 points and 5 goals from Atu Ratu. Down here, all the way at the bottom, you had a game-winning goal from Carson Soucy. A lot of clutch moments, but it was really the goaltending that got us through because even though, like I said, we were scoring 2-3 goals for the most part, there were a lot of games when we were getting one, maybe two. So having those slim 2-1 victories went a long way. But now moving into the 2025 postseason, which is our second full postseason with the Canucks, headed into year number three with the franchise, we want to make sure that we are continuing to solidify ourselves as perennial contenders. In year number one, we were a fringe team that made it. That was great. In year number two, we said, let's make a legitimate push, and we made it to the conference final. Fantastic. But now, I I think the bar has been set for us to be a conference final, Stanley Cup final type of team. However, we will be dealing with the over four and a half million that we got to pay to the Oliver ekman Larson buyout. And we have to think about extensions to Sam Reinhardt this season. We got to give Atu Ratu a contract. But then the year after this one, uh, Thatcher Demko would need a contract. If we sort by UFAs here, Susie would be out of a deal, which wouldn't be the craziest thing to replace. But Colson would need a deal. One more year after that, you're looking at Willander, you're looking at Dano, Hronik, Hughes. So we're about a couple seasons away from having to spend big money again. Hronik and Hughes being locked in for two more seasons after this, uh, heading into 2025-26 is very helpful, but we're not far away from needing to pay big money. So if we were to go into free agency and give a big 8x8 eight eight or whatever type of contract, I think that would really hurt us in the long term. So we need to stay strong with this core, I would think. 
but also look to add the appropriate pieces to help us get that next level while also fostering the growth of our younger players like Ratu, like La Karamaki in the AHL. It's a very delicate situation. I can't say I especially recall being in a situation like this in our franchise mode series as of late. But all that being said, we're now headed into the 2025 offseason with a lot of things to think about, including the Sam Reinhart extension. We currently have about, we'll have about nine-ish million to play with. I'm not sure if that's factoring in the OEL buyout increase but it is a fair amount of money that could become even more if we were to say yes let's move out Matt Gua as Tom Willander is going to move up to the top four or we say let's actually move out Thatcher Demko and his five million those two players right there make up for over nine million that would give us over 18 million so we do have options and that's where the assistant general managers come into play in the last episode there were a lot of lengthy comments so as always a huge thank you to everyone who takes the time to think about thoughtful responses and how we can improve this team each and every one is thoroughly read and always replied to i can't always get to them in the video but i am always factoring them into my decision making process so thank you again for leaving them so we'll go ahead and start with cheating heel who said what a run unfortunately there's never any rest for gm data and his band of agms no there is not we have a couple of difficult decisions ahead of us and to me the first thing we need to decide is if we want to move on from demko he's been very subpar in the playoffs and de smith won't always be there to cover him forever if there is a decent option available either as a free agent or on the trading block we might as well take a chance and hope that ea goalie voodoo ends up on our side extension wise reinhardt should be our our priority especially if we can get him for around six million per year he's been decent on the second line and would likely produce more if we have to bring him to the first line even due to injuries having the center slash winger combo dual eligibility is also a bonus Ratu has been great but I go short term with him and definitely wouldn't go as high as the two million he's asking for he's been good but hasn't quite proven himself in terms of stability and production just yet at this point qualify Studnika and then trade him Hoaglander is also someone that we can that we we need to make a decision on before he stops growing and his value drops too much if we can get something decent we might as well move him now if we need to make a move for cap space our best options are probably Dano, Roy, or even JT Miller and some reasons why there hopefully Le Karamaki grows to at least a 79 overall in the offseason he can make the team big fingers crossed for that so a potential forward core could look like Miller, Pedersen, Kuzmenko question mark Reinhardt Besser Third line would be Ratu, Dano, Petkolzin, and Ratu maybe could see that second line. And the fourth line is a mix of Maroon, Oman, Klimovic, and Karamaki. I could see Perron, Kane, Smith, even Ben for our second line spot on a short-term deal. On defense, Hughes, Hronik, Hannafin, Willander, Susi, Roy, goaltending, question mark, and DeSmith. Gorgiev, Vimalka, even Aiden Hill could be interesting options to replace Demko if we want to move him out and we could get a re good return if we do. Not sure what's on the trade block, especially as far as prospects go, but we could think about packaging Hoaglander and maybe something else for a type of prospect who's not developing as well on that team either. An interesting swap that could be realistic as well. I could see it. Maybe even a defenseman who could make our lineup in a year or two. We have a good core. If we can improve slightly on our top six and find a safer option in nets, we could go all the way. Have a great off season and go Nux. Cheating Heel then ends off with some draft thoughts. There are some very interesting names at the end of the first round. Aside from that, not the deepest class. So we'll look at those suggestions. Likely getting at least one of the three low elites at the end of the first round. Maybe two if it's possible, but that'll be about it. So thank you for that Cheating Heel. So two of the major points in Cheating Heel's comment were Thatcher Demko and Sam Reinhardt. Essentially the major talking points of almost every comment. So I have my own thoughts from distilling all the thoughts from the assistant general managers and putting in my own input. So we'll get to that in a moment, but we'll just finish off a few more comments as there were some lengthy ones. Moving over to Brad. Brad had to say, Reinhardt and Miller were not very impressive this postseason at all. I understand Miller having the full no movement clause and we can't really do much about that, but I'm not sure we have to bring Reinhardt back next season, especially with him regressing slightly in overall. I think a discussion on his future needs to be had and if we move on, maybe a sign and trade or a move for someone we like in the draft could be in play. 
Signing someone for the top six in free agency might need to happen, but I don't think that the team will need to add talent to secure a postseason spot. Maybe we rotate some young guys in and get some more ice time during the regular season and then evaluate their performances near the deadline. And then from there, we acquire someone with high poise so that they can help us when it comes to postseason scoring. Of course, if someone who fits that bill is available in free agency, we should explore that as well. So essentially what Brad is saying is that we have a good team now, maybe give them an audition for a little bit and consider adding later on as opposed to adding now and stifling what may be. The center depth in the bottom six was not there in the playoffs this year, especially when Dano was out for a week or so. We need to get someone good on the draw as fourth line center who is capable of moving up in the lineup in case of injury and make sure that we have another capable center with us as 13th or 14th forward. Loved Aturatu so far. Hopefully he gets some growth here and we'd love to see him play himself into the top six. His contract asks are really nice as well. On defense, we should see some good growth, so no need to really touch upon anything aside from getting a seventh defenseman. We could consider moving on from Demko, especially with DeSmith as a playoff ringer. That would free up some cap space if we're eyeing someone in free agency or something else. Although he's only making five million. But Colson was fantastic, I think all considering. Hoaglander is just disappointing, so maybe his days here are done like Studnika. We might need to look at helping our AHL team a bit to help some of our prospects grow there as well. Yes, absolutely. Two horrible years in the AHL shell that'll be a big priority in free agency awesome reverse sweep in the first round let's get this team over the hump and let's play some finals games next year brad thank you for all those thoughts my friend very well said Moving over to JJ Canyon's comment, JJ had a lot to say in this one, including some thoughts on maybe getting a top six power forward like Brock Nelson. I replied to all of that in my own reply there on YouTube, but what I wanted to showcase was the paragraph that says, as for the defense, Matt Gua undeniably had an awesome playoff. That's not, well, that's never in question, but he's just priced himself out. As an 82 overall, yes, he can manage as a top 4D, but we want to give Willander the chance. And you know, he's making what, was it 4.3 4 million? So if we're gonna put him on the third pair with Carson Susie, who's also unfortunately making 3.25, it's just too much money. I wouldn't say we need to feel forced to move Matt Watt unless money becomes tighter, but I would say that he's pricing himself out as he's dropped from an 83 to an 82. Goaltending wise, I think some people are going to be calling for Demko to be cr traded, absolutely, but he's had two great regular seasons and he only costs 5 million. Stick with those two, being Demko and DeSmith. I would wait until the beginning of next season and then see which team can give Solovs a backup job. He deserves it. I think that's a fair thing to do as well. Unless he really grows and we got to reconsider at the start of next season, Silovs will likely be traded. He's going to be, what, 24, still a 79 overall. Let's just get a, some value for him and let him spread his wings and fly somewhere else if there's going to be no room in Vancouver. JJ ends off by saying, sorry for the long-winded comment data, never any need for an apology for that, and I always appreciate you taking the time to read them. Of course, of course, my friend, excited for the offseason. JJ, thank you so very much for those thoughts. For another little skim here, I hop over to Super Loser's comment. As Super Loser said, great episode as always, Data. Here are my thoughts. I think we still need another playmaker in the top six. So option number one may be find someone who can play in the top six now. Someone like Nick Ehlers or trade picks to get someone from the trade block. The problem is we don't know if we'd have the money to afford a guy like Ehlers long term. We don't know what their ask is going to be. And with draft classes starting to get deeper, we don't want to give up too many picks to have to acquire someone. So then for option two, why not go out and sign someone like Steven Stamkos to a one-year deal and then trade Wa and Hoaglander for a playmaking prospect? Wa is fine, but like you said, Willander is ready to kick him out of the top four most likely, and his cap hit could be better spent elsewhere. We could also move out Hoaglander as Pedersen and Miller are the top six two-way forwards, and there's not really a spot for him in there with the way that he's been growing as well. I know that JT Miller has been in trade talks, but at 32 with five years left on an eight million no movement clause, I don't think we can move him at the moment. And honestly, neither do I really want to. He just had an amazing regular season, terrible in the postseason, but good enough scoring, what, 90 plus points in the regular season? I think I want to see more from JT before we start to think about uh, having him wave a no movement clause. That's why, as Super Loser says, maybe in two years when it turns into a modified no trade clause, we can think about it. But for now, we're stuck with them. And I don't think that's a bad thing. By then, Hoaglander will be 26. And Hoaglander has struggled massively on his third line role. With Dano moving down to the third line, Hoaglander would be the odd man out. 
So those are thoughts for the top six. Of course, does that include Reinhardt or not? Depends on which way we want to go. The last YouTube comment will come from Kieran across the pond who says, great vid again from London, England. Perhaps with this draft, you can look to trade Studnika or more likely Hoaglander so you can trade up for Korpikoski. That's a prospect that a few people mentioned. I believe he's a two-way centerman slated to go somewhere at the end of the top 10 in the draft. He might be the answer to the third line center issue. He's obviously capable defensively too, which will help the plus minus. Otherwise, great top six in defense and love to see Patty Maroon prosper. Keep it up. Thank you very much, Kieran. As I'm scrolling through the rest of the comments, I see so many other great ones I'd love to highlight in this video. I know it's an off-season episode, but the comment segment has already been quite long, so I'll try to end it off here in the Discord server with one of our AGM veterans, Hobbsy, who says, Playoff thoughts are as follows. Pretty good run, all things considered, especially after the first three games of round one. That speech before game seven with the young boy in front of the TV was one of the most motivating things I've ever heard. Data should become a motivational speaker with speeches like those. I'm glad you appreciated that one. That was one of my best, I think. On to the off season. First point here, I think it's time Demko heads out. Back to back playoffs, he's lost the crease. He accidentally got a chance against Chicago and didn't perform that well either. Plus, moving his money out could be beneficial for free agency moves. Perhaps a deal involving pick nine to grab that Finnish guy that I don't remember his name, that's uh, Korpikoski. That could, then we could run DeSmith and Selovs or sign slash trade for another guy to go with DeSmith. Next point, JT Miller did not impress me. He could be on his way out shortly, although maybe not yet, unless we're replacing him in free agency with one of the late 20-year-old guys on a cheaper contract than Miller. I don't think this is priority one, but something to consider. Next point, if Willander's going into the top four, then Watt needs to be moved out for money reasons and replaced with an 81-82 overall who's making half of that money or less, ideally, than maybe another guy, 78-79 overall on league minimum for depth. Next point, the idea of Brad Marshall in a Canucks jersey, he might be a free agent, seems funny to me, so him or Stamkos on a one or two year deal would be my top options. And finally, as for the draft, if we trade up to nine, I mentioned Korpikoski, if he isn't possible, then the best case of action is to grab one of the low elites, or maybe there's enough value we can scrape together paired with pick number 47 to trade up and grab a second low elite guy at the end of the first round as well. I think that's all I got, let's build on this run and go even further next year. Hobbsy, thank you so very much, my friend. So with those comments and all of the other ones distilled in my mind, here are my thoughts. The biggest thing in last episode, if I did a little uh, keyword finder, was Demko. That was the biggest point of contention in every, almost every comment, I would think, from last episode. Thatcher Demko, back-to-back -back seasons of 35-plus wins, back-to-back -back seasons of, you would think about top five in Vezina voting compared to the league as well, but back-to-back post-seasons of losing the crease to his backup, going one, five, and one in seven appearances over the last two post-seasons with like an 870 save percentage and something like 3.8 goals against average. It's unacceptable. At the same time, Thatcher Demko is on a $5 million deal, which is very helpful when you consider our cap situation. If you look at our buyout penalty at the bottom, 2.347 is becoming 4.767. So to have an elite goaltender, on paper at least, at $5 million, that's a big plus. If we were to move him out and get a guy like Shesterkin or Huso, whoever else might be in free agency, for eight, nine plus million, that's an extra four whatever million that we don't really have. To have our tandem at $5 5.9 million is a huge bonus in this franchise where we're paying so much money to the buyout penalty. Also, there's the fact that Demko is likely unhappy. It's not just us deciding do we keep you or not. Demko is also probably unhappy that he's been benched in back-to-back postseasons as one of the league's elite goaltenders. He has to be embarrassed after all that's been happening as well. He's lost the crease in back-to-back postseasons. However, if we keep him for one more season, he's still our starter. It would allow him to get his value as high as possible once more instead of trading him when his value is at its lowest right now. And then, even if we were going to let him walk, I would say we could have the storyline be that we would not let him walk to unrestricted free agency. If need be, we would sign him to an eight-year extension and then trade him, do a sign and trade when he was when he's 30 or 31 years old. If he were to do the same thing again where he has a good regular season but then falls apart in the postseason, we could still give him a big eight-year extension and trade him out, thus giving him as much security as possible with the eight-year contract, not the seven-year that he would only get if he was a free agent, but the eight-year if he extends with us, getting 
getting the most money possible and then being allowed to leave and try to go do that somewhere else. So especially with the buyout being what it is, I wouldn't mind hanging on to Demko and DeSmith as our tandem for another season at least. I know he's probably unhappy and so are we and so are the fans, but I think his AAV of 5 million is what saves him the most. Also, what Pat says here in the Discord server is, I'm all for a final chance for Demko. DeSmith was white hot, so he was the guy to go with, but I can't shake how good Demko has been to get the team to the playoffs and add in his cup wins with the Flyers and the Sabres franchise modes from the past for us. And you know, it's hard to shake. While those were other versions of the game, I still believe. So although, you know, he's probably public enemy number one right now, I think there could be a good story for him to stick around for one more year. And worst case, we do right by him, give him a big eight year extension and trade him out. So those are my Demko thoughts. Now the other big point of contention in the comments was Sam Reinhart. Now when we acquired Sam Reinhart, he wanted upwards of seven and a half, eight plus million, eight and a half million on a multi-year contract coming off of a 73 point season comes to Vancouver, scores 65 points, did very well. He actually was one of the league leaders in takeaways at 132, a very good two-way playmaking player. He did a great job, but in the postseason, fell apart a little bit, only scoring seven points and being a negative two in 19 games, playing on the first and second line. So Sam Reinhardt's Overall has dropped to an 86, and his contract demands have also dropped to 5 by 6.85. It goes even less if we go to six years. So Sam Reinhardt seems to be open to taking a hometown discount, a type of 6 by 6 kind of contract. And once again, the AAV is really hard to get past here. In such a tight year, again, I gotta say that again, we're gonna have, what, 9 million to play with? 9.173 million? If we're gonna go out and give all that to one player, then we have nothing for the rest of the depth on our team. If we can get Reinhardt on a $6 million deal, and then even with everything going on, we still have about 3 million to have some wiggle room to sign Ratu especially, that would have a lot of value in and of itself. He wants the extension, he's willing to go cheap. I love that gesture from him. Even though his overall has dropped to an 86, I'm not really worried. I think he'll bounce back quite easily. He still has all of his X factors. We saw how many takeaways he had this season. He had a nice 65 point year as a top six forward. I'd say at this dollar value, it would be foolish not to extend Reinhardt. So those are my thoughts. I know there's been a lot of waves of rumors and whatnot, but I'm thinking keep Demko, extend Reinhardt, get Ratu on a deal, and then figure out some other middle six winger in free agency with a little leftover money that we might have. Especially if we move out Matt Roy, we could really get a solid enough middle six guy that we could trust, like a Perron, a Kane, a whoever else, on maybe like a one or two year type of deal. So those are a lot of thoughts from me and the assistant general managers. I'm gonna say let's get into the off season now. And first things first, I'm gonna offer Sam Reinhardt that extension. We could go as low as like even lower than five and a half million on a six year deal. But I'm gonna say let's try and be realistic here. He's taking a bit of a hometown discount. He could make upwards of 6.75, 7 million in free agency. But a six by six, he gets a little extra term than we'd want to give. I prefer to give him four years because his demand is even lower. But at 29, does he want to be risking what his value might be at the age of 33. I think he'd really want to lock in the six years, but to repay us for giving him that, he's going to take a discount at six million as opposed to the seven and a half plus eight million that he previously wanted. So six by six on Sam Reinhardt, I think with the salary cap being over 90, 92 and a half million, I think that is very digestible as in today's NHL, that would be even lower. I think he's worth it. So Sam Reinhardt, six by six is the extension that we'll offer and we'll see what he has to say about it. Other extensions I think we can wait on. Ratu, I wouldn't mind getting him done actually because that's like really fair. Uh, a two-year deal is way cheaper at 1.725. Three years gets it to 2.1. We can even go four years, keep him as an RFA, but I don't know if I want to use all of his RFA years up just yet. Maybe two years of RFA, then another two years of RFA, then he gets his big contract. So I think after having a solid rookie season, I think a two-year bridge would probably make the most sense especially for us, as for the next two years, that's when we're gonna be the tightest on money. So two years at 1.5, I think would be very good for Atu Ratu. And we'll see what they have to say. So the two biggest extensions, we'll see what they have to say. The rest we'll take care of later on. Studnika is definitely a guy who's on his way out. Negative 26 on the regular season this year, just a black hole. We played him for three games in the postseason due to injury. He had one assist, was a plus one, then a negative one, then a negative one, to end as a net negative one. So Studnika, we tried to get some growth out of you when you had low top six potential. You're now low top nine, you're 26. It's over, buddy, I'm sorry. 
And before we go to the draft, I just want to show you that I did some due diligence on who some good depth pieces could be for us. If we look at players who played minimum 50 games and then sort by the most takeaways, and then we go and look here for players who weren't like big point guys. If I look at guys who had like 20, 30 type points, one guy who pops up is Marcus Johansson, who really stands out as a guy who scored only 39 points, everyone around him 70, 80, 90 points, and playing 13, 51 per night. Marcus Johansson had 130. 39 takeaways so I would love to target Marcus Johansson as like a third line kind of guy just to throw it out there but I would prefer not to trade for him and just see what happens in free agency because again if our lineup with Reinhardt and Ratu both in it would look like one two three on the first line Reinhardt Besser and then maybe someone else on the third line Dano Hoaglander or Dano Padkolzin Ratu on the third line then the fourth line is whatever then there is room for that second line winger. However, if Ratu could grow into the top six or play his way into the top six for next season, that would be incredible. So more of a middle six player rather than a top six player is probably what we're targeting. So I'm not sure about Stamkos. But someone who we can count on stability-wise and production-wise a little bit more, especially if we get injuries, because if Ratu's already in the top six, we get an injury in the top six, but Colson has to come up, then O comes up, okay, we could do then another injury, and we're really up the creek. So I want to have some better middle six options. So all that being said, really long intro. Thank you for bearing with me. It's a big off-season. We have a lot to think about. It's one of the busier ones in terms of many different permutations and options and different paths we can go down. So here we are at the draft now, 2025 draft the Canadians have the first and the third pick uh, the first pick only the 10th overall pick wants to be traded the stars are open to trading pick number 10 and we said that player Korpikoski was going around number nine it would be tight Raimo Korpikoski that would be really tight medium elite NHL ready I'd love to get a guy like him for third line center but it doesn't look like teams want to trade so we'll sim up to pick number eight or nine and see how things are looking by there, maybe? Let's see. First overall pick, this guy Markstrom goes to the Canadians. Medium elite, 83 overall. Stefan Markstrom, whoo, there you go. 83 overall, 18 years of age. Uh, Zane Marks goes to the Predators. Third pick, uh, Haggins, uh, James Haggins, real life prospect who was added. He is going to the Canadians as well. So two big selections for them in their center core. Misa going to the Blue Jackets. McQueen going to the the, um, the uh, LA Kings. Gavin going to the Senators. Another L Carlson going to the Ducks, really. Ludwig Carlson, Leo and Ludwig Carlson. Now both in Anaheim, amazing. Uh, Will, William Moore, yeah, another real prospect going to the Flyers. So now we are at pick number nine. How are things looking right now? Korpikoski likely would go here. So it's tough. The Red Wings don't want to trade their pick. I don't know if I can really force a trade here. Do the Wings really need anything here? They have their 12 forwards. They have a few on expiring deals, but I'm sure they'll have the money to resign them. They seem to have... Oh, they're at 85 million. I'm, I'm sure they have the money to resign at least most of those guys. Defense, one, two, three, four, five, six. Plus, they have a couple more. Only one an expiring deal. Do they have a starting goaltender? They have Huso expiring, just won the Vezina. But I don't know. It depends how they use their money. They probably can't resign their goalie and the forwards. So I bet they would be interested in a Thatcher Demko. Would they if I go and look here? Not even. But I, maybe we could try and force it, but I don't think it makes a lot of sense. I think the Wings would want to get a good young piece when they have Zucker, Perron, all these guys expiring. Let's just let it be. If we can try and trade for 10, we can. But let's see what the Wings do here at number 9. And they take him. Korpikoski, 77 overall, medium elite, two-way forward. Yeah, would have been nice to have him. Good two-way centerman. He would be a good piece for us of the future, absolutely. But that's why the Wings wanted him. So sometimes we can't always get what we want in EA land. we got to try and make the other teams have uh, aspirations as well. Porter Martone could be a guy here. Six foot four, two years away. But I'm not sure we really want to use all that value to try and trade up when we can already just get a low elite guy later on anyways. So it doesn't look like we're going to be trading up here, but we can still make a trade. Venick goes uh, to the Dallas, not uh, Marcone. We can still make a trade though, because we definitely want to be moving Studnika, maybe even Hoaglander as well, because he's pretty much out of our plans at this point. So sorry, if I were to go into the fine trade and I would think what might player, what might teams offer me for Hoaglander and Studnika together... I'd be curious to see that and Studnika together. What would teams be offering here? A second and a fourth, a second and a fourth, Stan Coven and a seventh, Misa, another Misa, Bannock who they just drafted, okay. Two thirds, two thirds, Scandella, two thirds. So we could get a second and a fourth in next year's draft, or we could look at getting a, a centerman right now from the Dallas Stars. Who's this guy, Misa? 
is it Luke? Uh, Luke, yeah, Luke Misa. Luke Misa, 72 overall. He was the 30th overall pick in last year's draft. Uh, playmaking centerman. He scored, what, 76 points in 67 games in the OHL. Medium top six potential as a playmaking centerman. Not a bad prospect here. Uh, I wouldn't mind getting a, a playmaking prospect, as one of those comments had said earlier. So Hoaglander and Studnika, uh, the stars as buyers take them on. Hoaglander has an extension about to kick in. Studnika, who knows what they do with him. But they give up a prospect for a good top nine forward, at least in Hoaglander. I think this would make sense for them, especially considering that it doesn't seem like they're super high on him. Can I add a seventh to this? Misa and a seventh for Hoaglander and Studnika going to Dallas. Dallas, what do you say about this? Rejected, sweeten it just a touch. So I guess let's just swap 7th next year. Why not? Do we even have a 7th next year? Not even. Let's swap 6th. I'm going to hope that I'm better than you. Let's swap 6th in next year's draft. Why not? What do you say here, Dallas? Trade accepted. All right. Thank you, Dallas. Niels Hoaglander, best of luck in Dallas, my friend. All the best to you. Thank you for your time here with the Canucks. We tried to get as much growth out of you as we could. You showed some flashes here and there, but ultimately, just not enough room in the lineup. Ratu pushed you out a little bit, and we hope that you'll be able to thrive with the stars. Luke Misa, welcome to the Canucks organization, my friend. I always love to get real-world prospects when possible. First round, 30th overall, drafted in 2024, last year's draft. Hopefully, he can get some good growth and be a solid centerman for us in the future. All right, so Luke Misa's on board. I think that's pretty much the only trade that we we're going to make. Um, I think we can advance towards our pick now. So we get value for Hoaglander. We get value for Studnika. Not a bad prospect to throw in the system. Spence, Martone. Let's advance a few more. Okay, we're at pick number 20 now. Where are those low elites slated to go? Uh, okay, not yet, eh? We still have until about 26, okay? Let's see what the rest of the teams are going to keep doing here. We got the Flames. A lot of medium top sixes are going. Blah, blah, blah. Medium top 6D. Yikes. Now, the Vegas Golden Knights would trade pick number 24. And then no other pick till 28. So trading for pick 24 might be the one here. Because our the guys we want won't be there at 30. Especially if we want... I think Dallas Johnson is the guy that we want. Henry, Johnson, and Mirnov are three players that we were looking at. Defensive defenseman, sniper, and two-way forward. Johnston, 17 years of age. He's three years away, which is typical. But low elite, A- minus shooting at 17. Not bad. I think that's pretty... Pretty solid numbers for a late first round pick. I would prefer to get him, the Swiss Sniper. So if we can get pick 24 from Vegas, I'm sure Vegas is not very happy with us right now, but they want to move the pick. We'll give you pick number 30. You trade back a little bit and it's not a good draft. We don't want to really use too many late picks anyways. Could a fifth be enough? 30 and 158 to move up to 24. It is. All right. Thank you, Las Vegas. Let's do it. We'll trade a fifth to move up to pick number 24. And with that pick, although there are some other tempting options, I think we have our guy here. Melvin Henry, defensive defenseman, three years away as well. But defensemen are very different in the game. Much harder to develop and much easier to find in free agency. Meanwhile, Mironov is also tempting as a two-way forward. Four years away at 18 years of age, though. So he's a year older and a year further away than Johnston. So let's head up to the podium. Good evening, everyone, and hello to our fans watching back in Vancouver. With the 24th overall selection in the 2025 NHL Entry Draft, the Vancouver Canucks are proud to select from SC Burn, Dallas Johnston. Dallas, welcome to the team, Bella. You are 64 overall. We'll take it. Low elite 64 with two and a half star shooting, but 17 years of age with all 80s is good as well. I'd rather see two and a half star shooting with all low 80s than two and a half star shooting with like 68 accuracy and 89 power. So I'll take that. Not bad at all. Seems to be an okay skater, but everything else will be, will definitely have to develop over time. And that's Dallas, baby. There you go. Dallas Johnson, welcome to the team, my friend. No other picks really want to be traded, so I don't think we could trade up for another low elite, unfortunately, here. Mironov goes at 26. He's a year older and lower in overall. So I know we want a two-way forward, but I think Johnson was definitely the guy to go for there. Uh, now Henry's still available at pick 28. That's surprising. He's still out here. He was slated to go 26. He's still here at 28. Even a top six forward in Liam Ledeen. Three years away, a shooting, two-way forward potentially. Should we try to trade up for another, maybe get two Swiss guys here? Cole Schneider, another Swiss player, similar to Rod Brindamore. Henry's interesting though, because you don't really have any defensive prospects in the system. There's even Gord Wheeler, medium top four defensive defenseman, three years away. I, I, let's at least explore the option here with the Oilers. 
Okay, actually the trade did not work out. I tried my best to make it work, but it, we're having to dip into third round picks next year. I don't think it's worth it. Low elite, 65 overall defensive defenseman, Melvin Henry going to the Edmonton Oilers. I'm sure he'll be fine. Who knows if he develops or not, but I'm okay with just simulating forward to pick. Let's go to pick 47 then. Forget making any trades at this point, I suppose. Pick number 47, we're gonna go ahead and take one of those low top four defensemen. Jared Siegel or Miko Vert Vertinen? Vertinen? So Siegel is six foot four. Four defensive defensemen and three years away. Uh, Worth in also three years away, uh, but a two-way D, six foot two, two-way D. Anyone else down here? Low top four D here. Orlando Martins, four years away. So yeah, we'll take one of those two, but the question is which one? This is a tough one here. They're pretty identical. It just comes down to the physical and the defense, as Siegel has better physical, better than both, eh? Better in physical and on defense. I guess Siegel's the guy then. I know we have uh, the right side's a little clogged, but by the time he would make it, I think it would probably be at least room for the third pair. So Jared Siegel, welcome to the Canucks, my friend, from the USA West. He is 64 overall, low top 4D. Jared Siegel, there he is. Okay. Now, my question would be, what was the other guy? So our guy was 64 overall, two-star defense. And the other guy was 62 overall, one and a half star defense. So I think it was the better pick. I know this guy is a left-handed two AD, which is different than a right-handed defensive defenseman. But still, I think that was the right call. So next pick would come at number 126. The guy Frolov is set to go like 139, so we should be okay to sim all the way to 126. And then we'll use the last couple of picks there. Let's see, like AHL top six forwards are going. It's a tough draft. So we'll go ahead and scroll down to our guy, low top six, Yuri Frolov, 17 years of age from Russia. Definitely gonna be like a 48 overall, five year project type of guy. 51 overall, there you go. Yuri, welcome to the team, my friend. 126th overall, power forward. All right, we'll take it. And lastly, we'll sim 10 more picks to 136 and make our final selection of this draft. Not the best draft, as we mentioned. Maybe we even trade this pick for a pick next year. So just bottom six is, yeah, you know what? That wouldn't be a terrible idea. Yeah, let's try that. 136 from the Flyers to the Canadians for a fifth next year. What do you, all right, trading seven. Thank you, Kent Hughes. There you go. We'll take a fifth in next year's draft instead. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. There's the draft. Not much to say about it. We trade out Hoaglander. We trade out Studnika. We make a little move to get Dallas Johnson at 24. Only three selections in this lackluster draft, but I'm content with the selections that we made. So now let's advance a day and see what type of answers we may get from our uh, extensions that we sent out. A couple of coaches need new contracts, no problem. Scouts, blah, blah, blah. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see it. Easy decision from Sam Reinhart. Let's go six by six on Sam Reinhart. The hometown boy will be sticking around after his one year deal has come to an end. And Ratu, easy decision as well. Beautiful. All right, he's happy about the amount of games he suited up for last season. Great. So now if we head to the re sign phase, our actual number uh, amount of money left is 3.893 million. And we only have to take care of a few pieces here, so it shouldn't be an issue, especially if we want to trade out Matt Wow, it shouldn't be any problem to get a good middle six guy. So I'll take care of most of these UFAs and RFAs on my own. A lot of the, uh, the uh, AHL team will be changing. Most of these players will be released. Unsigned players, I don't think we'll sign anyone yet. There was a comment talking about O'Brien and maybe getting him into the AHL because he hasn't grown much yet in the, AH, in the uh, US system. But we can wait until the preseason of next year to make a decision on that. Don't got to sign him just yet. And that'll be that. So I'll take care of that off screen and come back in just a second. All right, so just about ready to advance the day here. Philip Di Giuseppe, this past season, we gave him 32 games, two goals, three points, negative seven. He had a tough time, but I think he was really pulled down by Studnika. We sent him down to the AHL, 25 points in 41 games. Let's try him again as maybe 13th forward this year, if he wants to resign. So one year, we'll give him a little bonus for uh, for his trouble. It wasn't really the problem of that fourth line. So one year, 950K, and we'll advance for the rest of those other guys. Alrickson and Brustovich, two of the main prospects who need contracts now. We haven't really talked about Hunter Brustovich, but he is one of the better prospects in the, for the Canucks in the real world. In the OHL this season, 68 points in 66 games. So hopefully, even though he only has medium top 60 potential, he could become something for us. Let's advance a day here and see. Easy decision from Di Giuseppe. All right, great. 
Jet Wu, Linus Carlson, Oman, Alrickson, Brustowitz, Forsell. All right. So that leaves us with Hathaway, Hag, and Dries here. Hathaway does want 2.1 million. I enjoyed having Hathaway. I like his defensive attributes, but as an 80 overall, it's hard to, ex to really excuse that kind of money. Plus, he was an 81 overall with 91 shot blocking, 91 stick checking. He's gone down a little bit. So I think Garnet Hathaway has to walk. The bit too rich for my blood. Hag also would love to keep him a seventh defenseman, but uh, 1.6. 7 million. There are guys who are going to be closer to league minimum free agency who we could likely get. So Robert Hag, we're going to go ahead and let him walk as well, but we'll keep an eye on him. Sheldon Dries, I wouldn't mind bringing him back. Same type of thing as uh, Di Giuseppe, could be a 13th forward kind of guy. He's 31. I don't think he'd be upset to stay another year, make 850k with us. Why not? RFAs are all taken care of. Dries would be the last guy, and he's on board. Easy decision. All right, lovely. That will now allow us to head into free agency with 3.923 million. The ability to say maybe we move on from Matt Wa, and we still have a lot of spots to fill in the AHL. So I'm going to take care of some of the scouts and those coaches at expiring deals, and then we'll head to July 1st. Okay, ready to keep on advancing. Let's see what the coaches and scouts had to say. Happy to accept. Beautiful. Happy to join the team. Great. You've been here for two years. Happy to join the team. Great. You've been here for two years. And that is about it. So here we go. Headed into July 1st. Ladies and gentlemen, the biggest thing as always, who are those big fish who have dropped into the pond here for free agency? Ooh, Dreisaitl. So we had Dreisaitl in our Penguins series. I don't think we want to go after him, especially with Elias Pettersson on our team. Shea Theodore at a 91 overall. He wants 13 million. Brad Marchand wants over 10 million and three teams are interested. Slave and Tarasenko to Foley. Wow. If we just went to affordable, who even pops up? Smith, Zucker, Kubelik. Okay, not the worst options, actually. Some 84 overall kind of guys show up, at least. But we're looking at all UFAs. Lots of big names. David Perron, 4.4 million. That's probably the most interesting at 86 overall. David Perron, 54 point season last year, two way forward. I think, yeah, still has top six potential. He immediately jumps out at me as the number one target here, I would think, at a $4.4 million ask. Even Yanni Gord is tempting at uh, center right wing eligibility as well. What did he do last year? Mm, good playmaking ability. 59 points from Yanni Gord, who has four star defense 88, 83, 88, 87, 82, 87, a bit lower from Perron. But he is more of the scorer with, what, 22 goals last year, a bit more. Even Patty Kane, though, only wants 5.2 million, but another team is interested if we're just looking at and even Jeff Carter still out there wow 40 years of age so yeah okay if we were to go after one of these guys Perron, Gourd, whoever it is unless we go after Riley Smith at 3.7 a bit lower on the scoring still good at 47 points what they do what kind of numbers here three and a half star defense he's a sniper so let's say that player is mostly being a second line player if you have Reinhardt down the middle and you have uh, Brock Besser on the right I wouldn't mind someone who can kind of do it all on the left because if Reinhardt's the playmaker and Besser is the sniper do I want another playmaker do I want another sniper I wouldn't mind someone like Perron who kind of does it both 22 goals 32 assists while Gourd is more the playmaker and then Smith is more the scorer see what I'm saying so I would love to take a shot here at David Perron, but it would necessitate some sort of move here. If we were to trade out Matt Roy and add another 4.3 million, we'd have over 8 million. We could still go after a defenseman after that. The defenseman here, if I look at affordable, anyone pop up affordable? 82 overall. You know, here. a guy like McNabb, Schmidt, that wouldn't be bad. So it allows Willander to move up and it allows someone else to come in on the third pair for making about half the amount of money. So I didn't want to necessarily move Matt Waugh if we didn't have to. I would say we have to, but I think this would be a beneficial move for us. So let's see what kind of the, what the market looks like for Matt Waugh. He came here from that deal with the LA Kings when he brought uh, Phil Dano over. He's been a good trooper. He's been a solid piece for us in our top four. No qualms, no problems with him, but at an 82 overall, I wouldn't mind moving him out so we can do what I just mentioned. Morin and a fifth. There are some prospect options, lower prospects, or we can go for a third and a fourth type of thing. Essentially, we could get a medium top nine forward or a medium top six defenseman with like a fourth or something, or we can go a third and a fourth. I think a third and a fourth is the better plan of attack, especially with what our scouting can uh, reveal. I, I, they're all thirds and fourths from next year's draft, except for Winnipeg offering a third and a fourth here. But I don't want to send Matt Watt to Winnipeg. No, I don't want to do that. So the other, only other team, well, actually Carolina, but that's, I don't know, again, I want to say in this year's draft, Buffalo's third and Minnesota's fourth. I prefer to trade them to the East, though. So Carolina, could we get a third this year? 
you want to trade your third. It's Colorado's third, but it's still a third. Can I get a third from Colorado and a fourth from you for Matt Wah? What do you say to this? All right, trade accepted. So Matt Wah, thank you for your time here in Vancouver, my friend. They were a great two years. I enjoyed having you thoroughly. You join a good defensive core here in Carolina and you'll get your ice time absolutely. The last couple of years with Matt Wah, we enjoyed seeing him play two full seasons, scoring 36 points, being a plus 15. Five of his 12 goals were game winners, so thanks for that. And a couple of postseasons, five points in 24 games as a plus five. We appreciate your time here and we wish you all the best in Carolina. Now with that extra money, I say let's make a run at David Perron as well as going after a defenseman. The cap space isn't as much as I thought it would be actually. I guess the game moves some things around there but still enough to go after who we want to go after. So if we're looking at UFA forwards, we'll definitely want to fill up the AHL system as well after. David Perron, he's 39 years of age. Yanni Gord is younger but he wants a four year deal. I think that's why it makes sense as well to go after Perron. Would he want anything like a one year deal? No, eh? he's pretty set on two years. The demand does not really change so I think two years works this year more of a second liner then maybe the year after could be more like a third liner so I'd say let's go two years at 4.5 a couple hundred thousand more than Matt Wah was getting and that's that two years 4.5 contending team top six spot let's go David Vietin so let's now look at shift our focus over to defense if that's 4.5 off the books that leaves us with less than 3 million so if we're still looking at affordable we want to make sure we're scrolling down a little bit more into the 82s yeah exactly so the McNabs the Schmitz of the world Nate Schmidt former Vancouver Canuck Ryan Suter at 40 years of age that would be something we had a crazy storyline with him in the Penguins franchise mode uh, then we drop down to the 81s. So I'd say we want to go right sides. So that probably takes out Ryan Suter. Uh, Nate Schmidt might be the guy, actually. McNabb is a big shot blocker, though. we got to give him that with the 92 shot blocking. 88, 92, 86. Schmidt, 86, 84, 87, actually. So you know what? Maybe McNabb is the guy. But maybe what... Hold on. What if we just sort by only right defensemen? We have already on that left is full with Carson Soucy. If we only look on the right side, it would be probably like a Colin Miller kind of guy. Colin Miller, 85, 87, 85, 86 on the defensive attributes. Couple years at 2.4. Will Borgen, also interesting, but he actually led the league in giveaways last season, so I don't think we want to do that. So maybe it's Colin Miller. I really like McNabb, though. Does it matter that they're on the wrong side? No, I'm gonna, no, no, I don't care. I say we're going after the one who's just the better defenseman. McNabb really showed himself as that shot blocker, that defensive defenseman. Good plus minus, solid points to boot, four star physical, six foot four. I say let's do it. Big third pair. One year at 2.35. One year at 2.35 on Braden McNabb. Let's see what he says to that. So McNabb and Perron are the two big ones for the NHL lineup. We could consider a fourth line forward with whatever leftover money there is. But now what I want to do is just sign a bunch of two-way contracts for guys in the AHL. We're going to be playing there if I sort by potential. Uh, yeah, definitely some guys here who could be fillers down there. So let me just take care of a bunch of those spots. I'll also look at signing some new scouts, and then we can advance a few days to see what those first two dominoes to fall have to say. Okay, that's all done. That was a big process. Now we're ready to advance a couple of days. I'm a bit nervous, I gotta say, about the Perron contract. Forsling and a sixth going to the Canadians for a couple of seconds. Not usual, not usual that trades like that pop up, but okay. I'm a bit nervous about the Perron contract. I know we're not offering much more than he was asking for, but we can't really afford to overpay in free agency with our cap situation. So a bunch of scouts signing on. There's like a dozen of them. That's great. Randy Simpson, new AHL head coach. Lovely. And Mike Siegel on board in the NHL staff. That's great. All right, now we're getting into the big ones here. Margarita Burmistrov. Crazy names, man. <laughs> no, thank you, Edmonton. Evander Kane is interesting, though. Advancing one more day. Here we go. So Rasmus Kupari, some good AHL pieces. I gotta say, I really went out a little bit. Some good fringe NHLers to, to, uh, to populate the AHL team. Kupari, Foodie, Alexiev, McNabb on board. Great. Mason Primo, uh, Rybinski, Torgerson, Jared Anderson, Dolan, Nusianen, Kokkonen, Sampo Ranta. Lovely. Okay, so McNabb 
McNabb's on board. That's a big one. Now, the biggest question, though, is David Perron. I could go and look in free agency, see if anyone's interested, but no. Leicester's advance today. David, veux-tu jouer avec nous? What do you got to say, big boy? Let's go, David Perron. Bienvenue à l'équipe, mon ami. I was extremely happy to accept your offer. Your cash offer was most generous. It really was quite easy to make my mind up about your offer. Great. I love being able to get a free agent that we didn't have to overpay for. David Perron, bienvenue, mon ami. Woo, let's go. That's a big one here on July 6th. So now when we look at the contract situation, we're down to 2 million about. That's much better. We have a little bit of flexibility if need be. When we look at the forwards in our system, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. That's without, not, that's with Anderson, Dolan, Fudi, Kupari, but really it's going to be Dries, Di Giuseppe, Klimovic, whoever else. What Maybe some of these guys do end up making it, but with, uh, even Maroon is definitely going to be in the NHL. So good to have the whatever. We have a lot of options on the fourth line, but the top nine is absolutely set. When we look at defense, same thing. One, two, three, four, five, six. Willander hopefully grows to at least an 80, 81. But worst case, McNabb can still play in the top four, even Carson Soucy, but at a much lower cost than Matt Waugh was going to be in the top four at. Carson Soucy is open to an extension at actually a pretty cheap 2.85 million. Ah, oh, I might want to do that right now, actually, even at 85%. As always, defense the hardest position in EA NHL when it comes to the uh, contract demands. So maybe uh, I wouldn't mind two years at 2.5. Two years at 2.5 on Carson Soucy to kind of bridge the gap to some of those younger guys coming up. Yeah, let's do it. See what Carson has to say about it. Anyone else while we're at it? All expiring when we look at the entire team. But Colson would be up for a deal here. To, it could go one year to keep it as an RFA. Yeah, we'll probably do a one year, but we'll wait on that. I don't want to cheese it just yet. Let's see what he's going to be asking for a one year deal. Well, we know we'll keep him as an RFA, but will that one year deal be? And Thatcher Demko, what are you looking at right now? He wants seven and a half, so we know that it's it could be his last season with us, but at the very least, he can prove himself, get a big contract, and we move on from him once we do right by him. Silov is likely a guy that we move at the start of the preseason to give him a chance with another team who would need a backup goalie. But for now, I think that's it, ladies and gentlemen. We could look at another depth kind of thing with two million left to spend if we just you know always doing our due diligence if we sort by affordable then go by overall. Hey, there he is, Marcus Johansson. I was talking about Marcus Johansson earlier. <sighs> Marcus Johansson, Mister Takeaway, Mister Takeaway. He would go one year. Yeah, he'd be open to one year. Do we go one year on Marcus Johansson? Just where would he fit? Because he would be a fourth liner. Would he really be happy to be a fourth liner? That's the thing. The fourth line would be like Johansson, Maroon, and a guy like Klimovic at center. Would he really be happy to be a fourth liner with us? Playing like seven, eight minutes a night? I don't think so. What was he playing last season? 13 minutes? Yeah, 13, 51. Oh, I'd love Johansson, but just doesn't fit what we're trying to do for next season. Same for all these 82 overall guys up here. Maybe our old friends, Sam Steele and Pia Suter. <laughs> Tyler Johnson, who's been the bane of our existence in the first two years of our franchise mode so far. You know what, instead of me just searching through 100 different names here, let's go to the player search. If we look at all free agents between 79 and 81 overall, forward that is, who have 85 to 99 for defensive awareness. So 11 results that pop up. Sorting by overall here, Nick Benino, very interesting. Benino, 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 could be fourth line center, allowing Klimovic to kind of be a winger. I know he has like 75 faceoffs, I believe. So Benino could be a guy who slots up to third line center when need be, wouldn't be a horrible idea. Same for Tyler Johnson, who's been hurting us in the past, right? What if we go back again and go to a little bit more refinement? Give me some stick checking that is at least 85. The 11 then become nine. Let's go a little higher. Let's see 87. Okay, seven names left. At least 87 stick checking. Facts, uh, Sunquist, who've, who've we looked at in the past. Uh, 79 overall for Oscar Sunquist. Interesting, but the lowest of all the guys available here. Depending on what they'd be asking for, Fax is probably too good. But an older guy like a Benino and Eller, or even I don't think about Parise. If I want to get a centerman here, Lars Eller actually he was very good in the takeaway ratio last year as well. Lars Eller was, but he was playing. Benino was already a fourth liner last year. Lars Eller was playing big minutes, 15 minutes per night. But he's down to an 80 overall. Maybe it's time for him to move into the next stage of his career. So maybe Benino or Eller for fourth line center, and then Klimovic can be on the wing. Just a better option who can slot up if there's an injury to our center depth, as we were saying earlier on. 
So Benino would want 1.2 for two years. Eller would want 1.45 for one year. Does Benino's demand change for a one-year deal? No, 1.2. Stays. he has top nine potential, same as Eller. Eller's a lower overall, listed as a fourth liner. Benino listed as depth forward. They're both two-way forwards. Tough call here. Like I said, the giveaway ratio here. Eller had a big year, 35 points, playing power play as well. The giveaways to takeaways was not a bad ratio, 61 to 79 in favor of the takeaways. While Benino was at 28-28, but much less ice time. I don't know if we have to live and die by this, but just to say. That's even with uh, playing shorthanded time as well, penalty killing time. Tough call here. Nick Benino, definitely a fan favorite, but Lars Zeller is very interesting to me. As a guy who was playing third line last year, maybe taking a step back this year into the fourth line. I think I lean Lars Zeller, despite being a lower overall and asking for more money. I wouldn't mind one year on Lars and seeing what he can do. One year, 1.35. Let's see what Lars has to say to that. Let's go, buddy. Lars Zeller, as a Canadiens fan myself, I'm a big fan of Lars Zeller. We can make some interstellar jokes. Come on, Lars! Come on, Lars! We can make some interstellar jokes along the way. That's always a blast. Let's advance one more day. Lars, what do you say? Extremely happy. All right, Lars Zeller, welcome to Vancouver. Fourth line center. Appreciating the fact that we offered him the contract length he was asking for. No problem. And Carson Soucy also extends. All is well in Vancouver. So I think at this point, we can go ahead and simulate to the beginning of next season. Check out the lines, check out the trade blocks, and then call it an off season. Already a super lengthy episode. So we'll sim to next season and see what the growth gives us to start the 2025-2026 preseason. Everybody train hard, eat well. I'll see you at training camp. Okay, so here's how things are shaping up to begin year number three. On the top line, Kuzmenko up to an 89, Pedersen at a 93, and JT Miller at an 89, all getting the plus five. Lovely. On the second line, Besser is down to an 84, and so is David Perron. This is very interesting. Perron, despite having top six potential, had now dropped down to having bottom six potential. It's not the end of the world because we'd always planned for him to be a middle six guy who could rotate with, with Ratu, but it's a bit disappointing. What's good to note is that Ratu has grown to an 83 and could possibly be trusted with the top six a lot more than he would have when he was an 81 overall. So Ratu up to an 83, that's a big boost. Perron down to an 84, that's a letdown. And Besser, he's fluctuated between 85, 86 in this series. Now he's at an 84, not really sure why. He had a good 50 plus point season. I guess the postseason didn't do well enough, but I'm hoping that he can get back to where he should be because we can't have two 84s in the top six long term, I don't think. Anyways, the third line rounds out with Dano down to an 84. He's lost his X factors, he's getting older. He's not quite in his later years just yet, but he is 32 now. We got him when he was 30, I believe. So it's the last couple of years of his contract. I think it makes sense to kind of transition him to this third line role now. We brought him to Vancouver to be a second line centerman. He did that for two years. Now he's third line. Still going to get his power play and his penalty kill. I mean, maybe, definitely his penalty kill, but... Still gets his ice time. But Colson at an 82 gives that line a plus one. On the fourth line, Klimovich, Eller, and Maroon give it a plus one. Solid enough fourth line. I like it. On defense now, Hughes and Hronik with the plus two, Hannafin and Willander with the zero, and then Susie and McNabb with a negative one, unfortunately. This is another tough one. You know, I knew we were signing two defensive defensemen. I knew we were signing two big guys for the third pair. But McNabb was the best player available. That's why I went with him. We could try and spread things out or Willander who actually gets a plus five with Quinn Hughes. Maybe they have a little experimentation in the preseason. That could really be something. But on that third pair, I don't think we can really change anything. I don't see anyone in the top four coming down to the third pair. Goaltending, we still have Demko and DeSmith, 87-83. And the healthy scratches as of now would be Oman at a 78. Alexiev, seventh defenseman, also at a 78. Honestly, I forgot to try and get someone better for seventh defenseman. Alexiev still good, 87 shot blocking, 87 stick checking. He would be okay, but ideally we'd probably look at acquiring someone a bit better. My bad on that one. We should have went out and signed someone free agency. Just there's so many things I'm trying to keep track of. Uh, and at the same time, Lakaramaki has grown to a 78 overall. Minor scoring forward role, four star shooting, three and a half star puck skills. The big question will be, does Lakaramaki see NHL minutes this season? If yes, who does he replace? Probably, I guess, Klimovich. Or does he go 
go down to the AHL with a stacked team down here and play with an 80 overall Jared Anderson Dolan. He's had some growth. Ranta, Kupari, a lot of guys who are all in that high 70 overall range. So the Karamaki could really benefit from one more year in the AHL, not playing with whatever Sheldon Drees, but playing with higher overall higher scoring type players. Di Giuseppe, I wanted to see him in the NHL, so maybe we swap Le Caramacchi with Di Giuseppe and then try and get the most out of this AHL squad. On defense, not a lot of players that were really trying to grow, just Brustovich. so you know, we're gonna put him on the top pair and see what he can do with uh, Kokonen, who's an offensive defenseman. And goaltending here, Silas is up to an 80 overall, Rodriguez at 78. I'd prefer to have Rodriguez the starter and Ty Young at a 66 backing him up. His potentials dropped from medium backup to low backup, he's 21 now, so maybe we just trade Ty Young instead. But the question will be, what do we do with Silovs at an 80 overall now? What's our planned semi-long termish for the goaltending? So that's how the lines shape up right now. Definitely a lot to discuss on that. Let's also take a look at the trade blocks as always heading into this next season. If there may be any suggestions for start of the year trades or things that we may want to consider 10, 20 some games in, here is our trade value. If you're curious, O'Brien up to a 75, Mies up to a 74. We could even sign O'Brien and put him in the AHL with that stacked team. We could do that. Trade values down the list we go here. Pero, man, disappointing. Draft picks, we have a first, a second, two thirds, a fourth, a uh, two fifths, and a sixth. Looking at the trade blocks now around the NHL, just skim through those quickly to end it off. Here in Anaheim, sorting by overall, we see Terry, Duclair, Strom, D'Angelo, Kloran, lots of names on the Ducks, not really expiring. Uh, even Marcus Johansson with a lot of trade value. Lots of names here in Anaheim already. Arizona, some names here, including Noel Nord, legend in NHL 23 with the Penguins, certified bellow, Noel Nord. Bruins, nobody. Buffalo, Paterka, who's an RFA, JJ Paterka at an 85 overall, and other prospects. Calgary Flames, Tanev and Zadarov. Carolina Hurricanes, various prospects. Blackhawks, Seth Jones, Taylor Hall, Wenberg, Novak, lots of big names here for the Blackhawks, our rivals in the series. Avalanche have a few prospects. Blue Jackets, a few names there, including OEL. Dallas, Stan Coven. We were looking at Stan Coven, we were offered him, but 79 at 22. Fringe kind of guy. I, I don't know if we'd want to make a project out of him. And he does have at least a bit of uh, trade value, which would require us to move something the other way. So there are the Dallas pieces. Detroit Red Wings, a big prospects, including Korpakoski on the trade block. Wow, some big names here for the Red Wings. Yeah, Clark Caswell as well. Hmm. Uh, Oilers, we see some prospects there. Panthers, nobody. LA Kings, Dowdy, Toffoli, Kopitar, Fiala, Kempe. Their entire top six is here. Wow. Yanni Gord, who we're thinking about, instead of uh, David Perron, maybe we try to retcon it a little bit. We give David Perron for Yanni Gord and a little sweetener. Maybe. Could think about that. Minnesota. Wow. Spurgeon, Brodeen, Severson, Hartman, Erickson, Eck, Verana. The whole league's on the trade block this year. The Canadians, just Brown. The Predators, Gavrikov, McDonough, Goudreau, and Ny Nyquist. Devils have a bunch of various names there. Islanders, a bunch of names including Cole Hudson. There he is. New York Rangers, Truba, Trocek, Larson, Goudreau, Kreider, Drouet, and Harper. Senators, Yarventi, and a bunch of other prospects. The Flyers, nobody. The Penguins, nobody. The Sharks, Teravine and Bennett, Paul, Couture, Wheeler, and Burroughs. Big contracts, big names with big contracts. Boyd and Bertuzzo in Seattle. Australian Golagoski, wow, Golagoski, 40 years old, in St. Louis. Tampa, various prospects, including Isaac Howard. Maple Leafs, Tavares, Yarncrow, Kampf, Hathaway there. Ended up signing for 1.455. Jimmy VC, Vegas, Marchessault, Carlson, Carrier, Roy, Ocpozo, Sheesh, Washington, Wilson, Mantha, Milano, Backstrom, Kuznetsov, Strom. I haven't seen a league wide trade block uh, fire sale like this in a very long time. And prospects in Winnipeg. Sheesh. So there are the trade blocks around the NHL, ladies and gentlemen. Feel free to ask for details on any player that you want to know a little bit more about. And that about does it for this one. Heading into year number three, we want to be seen as legitimate contenders. What do we need to do to get to that point? Are we content enough with David Perron in the top six? Should we experiment in the preseason with Ratu up in the top six? Should we experiment with LaCaramaki? Should we experiment with Willander getting the plus five? A lot of things that we can think about. A lot of names that 
could see a little addition through the seven games of the preseason. What do we do with Silovs as well? Many different options for us. I like our lineup, but we always want to be thinking about improvements no matter what. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this lengthy offseason episode. We had a lot to think about. We made a lot of decisions. This is our team to begin this next season. Unfortunately, the salary cap does, you know, it did play a big role. We have uh, 748k to play with. Take the buyout penalty away, we'd have over 5 million in cap space. So the extra few million that would have gone to a middle six forward, that's David Perrault making four and a half. So we're definitely not dealing with the easiest situation, but I do like the team that we've built despite the constraints that are upon us. Let me know your thoughts on what we did this off season as well as what you'd like to see headed into the first half of year number three in 2025-26. Leave all those thoughts down here on YouTube or over on the Discord server, link in the description. Leave a like if you're excited for this third season. And of course, subscribe if you haven't already. For ongoing franchise mode uploads, both with our Canucks series as well as our live stream expansion, San Francisco Starfleet franchise mode series. So there's a lot going on here on the channel. As you can see, it's a very strong community that wants to build towards success and will be that much stronger with you as a part of it. So we'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments. Once again, thank you so much for taking the time to enjoy. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again in the next one as we begin year number three with the Vancouver Canucks.